Thank you for coming this evening. Before I start the lesson, let me give you a heads up. Good chance this lesson is not going where it may seem like it's going. So please don't make any final decisions about this lesson till we get through. And I'm saying that so that you will pay good attention as we go. Okay? So, our lesson this evening is about the using roast lamb on the Lord's Supper. We want to examine the evidence for the practice of having roast lamb on the Lord's Supper, and then evidence against it, and then we'll make some applications. So consider with me first of all, and there's a lot of reasons that could be offered for using roast lamb in the Lord's Supper. First place, lambs were often used in Old Testament worship. For example, the, many of the sacrifices, Numbers chapters 28 and 29, uh, lambs were used in the various sacrifices in the Old Testament, and in particular on the Day of Atonement. But the Lord's Supper is a memorial to our atonement by Jesus, who is our lamb. And Exodus 12, and this discussion there about the Passover. The Passover lamb was roasted and eaten, and Jesus is our Passover lamb, and so uh, he instituted the Lord's Supper at the Passover. So why should we not use eat roast lamb on the Lord's Supper? like Israel did in their worship. So that's one point that we may consider, and then another point is that we may consider it to be an aid to our worship. If Jesus is a lamb, and in the New Testament, he's our lamb, and we remember his death in the Lord's Supper. Isaiah 53, verse 7, he was prophesied to be a lamb led to a slaughter. And John 1, verse 29 and 36, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 1 Peter 1, we're redeemed by the blood of Christ as the blood of a lamb without blemish. In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, Christ is our Passover lamb. So, Christ is our lamb, all these passages, why not eat a roast lamb on the Lord's Supper and remember, in remembrance of that sacrifice, that lamb for us. And another argument that could be made to say we should use roast lamb on the Lord's Supper is that there's a lamb in heaven. A number of passages talk about lambs, a lamb in heaven. Revelation chapter 5, the lamb who had been slain, who of course is Jesus, verse 6, and redeemed us by his blood. Verse 8 and 9, he's worshipped in heaven, verses 12 and 13. And chapter 7, verses 14 and 15, those who washed their robes in the blood of the lamb, they serve God because salvation uh, belongs to the lamb, that's of course Jesus. Revelation 14 and Revelation 15, people in heaven sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. So you have a slain lamb as a symbol of Jesus. And that's offered in worship, and used in worship in heaven. And we know there's no sin in heaven. So how can it be wrong for us to remember in the Lord's Supper, Jesus as our lamb by eating roast lamb? And then we can use our talents for the Lord. That is the talents of people who... Uh, are good cooks, you can cook the, roast the lamb. Matthew 25 talks about the, using your talents for the Lord. We have some excellent cooks, so why not allow them to use their talents to prepare the roast lamb for the Lord's Supper? And then, another, in our final argument, God nowhere says not to. Lambs were used in worship in the Old Testament. There's lambs in heaven. Roast lamb and the Lord's Supper would remind us of Jesus' sacrifice. And people could use their talents to worship God. And a lot of people would enjoy eating the roast lamb. So can you find a passage that says not to? That tells us that we should not have the roast lamb on the Lord's Supper? And could we not conclude that those who would oppose it then were just troublemakers and causing problems in the church? Now, one danger of a lesson like this is I might persuade somebody <laughs> that that's right. So before we get any further, let's look at the other side of it. Let's consider the evidence against using the roast lamb. Despite all those defenses that have been used to justify it, let's look at the biblical responses that show why that's, those are not good reasons for using roast lamb on the Lord's Supper. We'll start with the last one about God that says not to, nor says not to, and we'll look at the others in order. But the first answer that I want us to consider with regard to the idea that God nowhere says not to is that Roast lamb in the Lord's Supper is different from what God did say. 
That is to say, every passage, oops, every passage that uh, talks about the Lord's Supper tells us what God does want on the Lord's Supper. He says to use the bread and the fruit of the vine, the cup. And there is no passage that tells us to use roast lamb. So if we look at Matthew, look with me please at Matthew chapter 26. And we could look at other passages as well about the Lord's Supper. But all three of the passages where the Lord is recorded as instituting the Lord's Supper, they all say that he used the bread and the cup, the fruit of the vine. Matthew 26 and verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, took bread, blessed and broken, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink them and all of you. But this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So here we're told what Jesus said to use in the Lord's Supper. No mention of roast lamb. He said bread and the cup, which is the fruit of the vine. And if we go to 1 Corinthians in chapter 10, verse 16 and 17, Paul describes that in the we break the bread in communion with Jesus' body and we drink the cup in communion with his blood. So again, we have the bread and the cup. That's the fruit of the vine. That's what he says we should use. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 29, goes back to the institution of the Lord's Supper and says it several times. In fact, he says it four times. He specifically mentions the bread in the Lord's Supper and five times he mentions the cup or the fruit of the vine. So if you take the three accounts <coughs> of the institution of the Lord's Supper, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> along with the two passages of 1 Corinthians, we have five passages, all of them describing what we should do in the Lord's Supper. <coughs> excuse me. And they all say bread and the cup, the fruit of the vine. None of them, none of them say roast lamb. If the Lord wanted roast lamb, why didn't he say so? He tells us what to use. He didn't include the roast lamb. And the gospel expressly warns us not to follow practices that men invent that are different from what God said. And here's a critical point in the discussion. It's a mistake to think, to know a thing is wrong, we have to have a passage that says not to do it. That's not the way God approaches what he tells us to do, especially in regard to the church and worship and so on. He never intended that he was going to list everything that we should not do. What he does is he tells us what he wants us to do and then says to avoid practices that are different from that. He tells us what to do and that's what he wants. He doesn't want anything different from what he tells us to do. So let's look at some passages that help us to understand that. Look at me in Isaiah chapter 55. And verses 8 and 9. Isaiah chapter 55. And verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God doesn't think the way we do. He doesn't want necessarily the things that we want. And so the fact that we think a thing would make good sense to use in worship is beside the point. We need to do what pleases God, and he tells us in his word what pleases him. And so he says in Jeremiah 10, 23, that the way of man is not in himself. It's not a man who walks you direct his steps. It's not up to us to decide what we think would be a good thing to do in worship to God. Or if you look in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So God's word says that we please him when we do what he says and don't change it, don't do something different. Well, apply that to this discussion of the roast lamb on the Lord's Supper. God's word says he's pleased when we eat the bread and we drink the fruit of the vine in the Lord's Supper. But roast lamb is different. It's not included in what he said. 
And so if we did that, that would be going by our own ideas. It would be by what seems right unto a man. But the passage says that results in death. And there are many passages specifically that tell us that practices that are different from what God has told us to do are not acceptable and we should avoid them. In particular, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9. Jesus is discussing the concept of the scribes and Pharisees had about washing hands. He says, in vain they worship me, teaching us doctrines the commandments of men. So when we worship God, if we worship according to man's teachings that are different from what the Lord said, our worship is vain. It's empty. It's worthless. And there are a number of scriptures that make this point for very specific applications. Matthew 15, he's applying it to human traditions and washing of hands and so on. If you look at Galatians chapter 1, in verses 8 and 9, he's applying it to people who are trying to bind the Old Testament law. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, he says, even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. So again, he tells us in the gospel what we should do, and somebody would try to teach us to do something different from what the gospel says, the curse of God would be upon him. Okay, and 2 John, verse 9, a little epistle of 2 John, in verse 9, try that again, 2 John, verse 9. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. And so, here are a number of verses and a lot of others that teach us the concept. We should not be approaching our worship and our service to God by asking, where does God say not to do this? What we should be looking for is, where does God include this act? In the Lord's Supper in particular, we look at what the Lord says. He says, eat the bread, and drink the fruit of the vine. He doesn't say, don't use roast lamb, but he doesn't have to. He tells us to do what he says and don't change it. Using roast lamb would be something different from what he said. And so the fact he doesn't say not to doesn't change the fact that it's wrong because it's not included in what he did say when he tells us what to do. Okay? So let's go back and look then at some of the other points that are made to try to defend roast lamb in the Lord's table. It was said that, well, it's used in the Old Testament, and they gave us some passages, that, and surely it was. Lots of examples of lamb being, in fact, being even sacrificed and eaten and so forth. But the thing is, the New Testament is our pattern for today. The fact that it practices in the Old Testament does not justify it today. We follow the New Testament today. Let's look at it in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Hebrews chapter 10. In verses 9 and 10. The whole book of Hebrews is discussing the difference between the Old Testament and the New. The law given through Moses and the gospel of Christ. So verse 9, he said, Behold, this is Jesus, Behold, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second, by that way we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So Jesus came to take away the First Testament, the Old Testament, the Law of Moses, and give us instead the Gospel of the New Testament. It's by that will, by that covenant, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus. And if you look in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, and some following verses as well, Colossians chapter 2, and verse 14. Having wiped out the handwriting requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So that old law was removed when Jesus died on the cross. He nailed it to the cross. And so verse 16 says, let no one judge you. 
in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come with the substances of Christ. So he lists some specific Old Testament practices. He says, don't let people judge you about those because that's not part of the New Testament. That's the part that what God, Jesus nailed to the cross. They were just a shadow of things to come. And we can go on and look at other lots of other passages. Galatians 3, verse 24 and 25, the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ. But now that we're under Christ, under the gospel of Christ, we're no longer under the tutor. And then in Galatians chapter 5, in the first four verses, Galatians chapter 5, and verses 1 through 4. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you are become circumcised, that's the old law, Christ will profit you nothing. And again, I testify, again, to every man who becomes circumcised, he's a debtor to keep the whole law. If you become estranged from Christ, you attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. So what he's telling us here in the book of Galatians is another book that shows that Jesus removed the law. What he's saying here is that law, the whole thing, was removed. If you could try to go back and keep part of it, in this case, a circumcision, but it would apply to any other part of it, you go back and try to take part of it, you become responsible to keep the whole thing. And yet we know that much of it, it doesn't apply today. We know that the animal sacrifices don't apply today, the Levitical priesthood, circumcision that he's talking about here, the Seventh-day Sabbath, the various holy days, and the same things regarding roast lamb. To go back to the old law, to try to justify a roast lamb on the Lord's Supper, would make us obligation and our obligation to do the whole thing. Keep it all. And of course his point is, if you do that, then Christ has become of no effect to you, and you're fallen from grace. So we must not use the Old Testament to justify roast lamb or any other practice that's not included in the New Testament. Now, for me, and here's something to think about for you, that contrast between the old and the new is one of the things that especially helps me to see that God does not want us to follow those Old Testament practices today, specifically as it applies to roast lamb. When God wanted lambs in worship, he plainly said so. He didn't have any question about whether he wanted them or not. It was right there, plainly written. If he still wanted us to use roast lamb today, shouldn't it also be clear in the New Testament? But where is it? You see, the, the difference between the old and the new, we know we don't follow the old as authority for us to, today. We follow the new. And so since lambs were plainly authorized in the old but not in the new, their absence in the new is, a, to me, a powerful argument that that's not what he wanted. He tells us what he wanted, and it didn't include those. Well, let's look at another of the arguments that could have been made for a roast lamb on the Lord's Supper. An aid to the worship. People say, well, it helps the worship because uh, the lamb represents Jesus, and the passage to talk about him as a lamb, and so on. The thing we need to understand, though, is that an aid is something that just helps us do what God authorized. But we still have to do only what he authorized. We have to do what fits the definition of what he said. It has to be something different, not another kind of act. If it's different, then you don't have an aid, you have an unauthorized activity. And the Bible illustrates the difference for us, and we often talk about these kinds of things. Noah and the gopher wood, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 14. God told Noah to make an ark of gopher wood. Now, if he had used, say, a hammer or a saw to make the ark, uh, to, using the gopher wood and make it, that would be an aid. You see, a, a tool or a saw would help him do what God said to do, but he's just doing what God said. He's making an ark. So that's a legitimate aid. It fits the meaning. He's still doing what the passage that God told him to do. But if he made the ark of metal, that's not what God said. That's different, you see. So an aid is something that simply helps you do what God says. But if you do something different than what he said that doesn't fit what he said, uh, a different meaning, then that's an unauthorized change. And we can see the same thing in New Testament practices, for example. We know in baptism uh, that God says that we're to 
buried people in baptism and raised to walk in the of life, Romans 6, verse 4. And he says in Mark 16, 16, that we must believe and be baptized to be saved and Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized for the remission of our sins. And from those things, we understand that baptism is a complete immersion in water. And it's one who has believed the gospel and repented. So a baptistry, a pool of water of some kind would be an aid. It's just something that helps you do what God said. If you immerse a penitent believer in the water, you're just doing what God said. You're baptizing and the, the pool that you use is just an aid. It's something to help you. But if you sprinkle or pour water on the person, that's different. You see, that's not what God said. It's not an aid. It's different. It's something that's not what he said. Or if you baptize a little baby who doesn't believe and hasn't repented and doesn't understand the gospel and so on, that's not an aid to baptism. That's something different from what God said. Now, when we apply that to the Lord's Supper, we find again that God told us what to use, to use the bread and the uh, fruit of the vine. Now, if we had containers to hold the bread or containers to hold the fruit of the vine, that's an aid. It just helps us do what God says, something to hold the element. When we use them, we're just doing what God said. We're eating the bread and we're drinking the fruit of the vine. It fits the meaning of what God said. But when we add roast lamb, that's something different. You see, a different kind of food. That's not, that's not bread and that's not fruit of the vine. It's something different from what God has said. It's not just an aid, it's an additional, different kind of food. And so we'd be not following God's authority. It's not a legitimate aid. What well, about the fact that the, uh, we have the lamb in heaven? Well, what God tells us in the symbolic descriptions of heaven is not intended to tell us about our worship today in the church. We have to remember that Revelation is a book of symbols. And it's highly symbolic, and there's a lot of mistakes made by people when they try to use those symbols in a literal way. And by the way, if you're going to take it literal, is that lamb in Revelation literally roasted and eaten as part of the Lord's Supper? The thing is, that when you have Revelation telling us about things practiced in heaven, symbolic things and so on, that doesn't authorize what we should do in our worship today. And so I list some things for you here, examples of things that are in the context of those passages that talk about the Lamb. Those passages that talk about the Lamb also talk about Mount Zion, four living creatures, the throne of God and voice of many waters, sea of glass mingled with fire and war with the beast, so we take those various things, those symbols of Revelation, and bring them literally into our worship today? Well, no, you see, that's, that's not the intent. That's not what the book of Revelation is intended to do, to take those things and make them literally. So why should we take the lamb and that symbol and bring it literally into our worship? Matthew 22, when Jesus was discussing with the Sadducees about uh, the resurrection, in answering their question, he said there is no marriage and there's no giving in marriage in heaven, or that's in the resurrection in heaven. Well, we have marriage here on earth. Jesus said there's no marriage in heaven. That tells us that the rules for heaven are different from the rules on earth. You can't assume just because the thing is described in heaven, especially not if it's symbolic, that somehow that's telling us what we should do in our worship to God on earth today. And so just as the rules of the past of the Old Testament are different from what the New Testament says about the church, likewise, our uh, rules about the future of heaven do not tell us what God wants to do in our worshiping church today. And then the last point about using our talents. Look with me in Matthew chapter 7. Verses 21 and 22 to 23. Here are some people who had talents. And they thought they were using them to please the Lord. Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, 
There are many wonders in your name, and then while I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So here were people who thought they were using their talents for the Lord. But the Lord wasn't pleased because they weren't doing what the Father said to do. So, yes, God has given people many talents. But just because a person has a talent doesn't mean we should use it in our worship. It may be used properly in some other way, but not necessarily in our worship. And I've got some examples here that we can understand. Uh, a butcher has a talent to killing animals. And some were using them in the Old Testament, animal sacrifices. But should we offer animal sacrifices in our worship today so that they can use that talent? Or <clears throat> an animal trainer. That takes talent. Uh, should we put a lion taming act or a dog show in our worship? Simply because a person has a talent. Athletes have talents, so should we have gymnastics and basketball and ping pong in our worship? Magicians, those who put on the trick magician shows, they've got some talent. Use that in our worship. Now you see, the point is, just because a person has a talent doesn't prove that it should be used in worship and service to God. Romans chapter 10, the first three verses, Paul talked about those who have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. What we do in worship to God, using our abilities, must be done according to what God has revealed. And that's why, then, we have all these passages we've talked about. The choice of what we do has to be authorized. It has to fit what God says to do. Now, hopefully, everyone can see and even though there's some reasons that people try to offer that they could try to use to justify a roast lamb and the Lord's Supper, that's not valid. It doesn't follow, and it would be wrong to do it. I hope we've seen that. But you may be thinking, well, surely there's more to this sermon than that, and there is. I want to consider another practice that all of these arguments that I've used regarding the Lord's roast lamb and the Lord's Supper all those arguments are used by other people to justify a different practice in our worship. And if you understood why roast lamb was wrong, then you ought to be able to understand why this other practice is also wrong. Because it's all the same arguments for it and all the same arguments against it for the same reasons. And that practice is the use of instrumental music in worship. Now, if you've discussed this use, this practice with people, you have no doubt heard them that sooner or later hear all, the, all these various reasons to try to justify the practice. With my websites, I'm continually getting people over the years defending various things that I discuss on the website, and all these arguments have been used to try to justify instrumental music in worship. But let's notice then the application as we understood, if we understood it with regard to Rose Slam, we should be able to see with regard to the instrumental music. So let's look at the arguments as they apply with regard to instrumental music. People say, well, God never wishes not to. But with regard to the Lord's Supper, we said yes, but he tells us what to do. He said bread and fruit of the vine. In the same way with regard to the New Testament worship, he tells us what kind of music he wants. Every passage that talks about music in the New Testament talks about singing and other words that refer to the same thing. Matthew 26 and Mark 16, when Jesus and the disciples had, had their Lord's Supper, when Jesus instituted it, it says they sang a hymn. Acts 16, 25, Paul and Silas in prison were praying and singing hymns. Romans 15 and verse 9, prophets predicted the Gentiles would glorify God and sing to his name. 1 Corinthians 14, I will, 15, I will sing with the Spirit, I will sing with the understanding also. And then we'll look at one of them, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. And this just illustrates all the others that we could look at. Ephesians 5 and verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The passage says we speak we sing, we make melody in the heart, not on an instrument, in the heart. Colossians 3.16, similar teaching and admonishing one another. In Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, raising your heart to the Lord. Hebrews 2.12, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing praise to you. 
Hebrews 13, 15, that is often the sacrifice of praise to God, the food of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And James 5, 13, if any among you cheerful, let him sing songs. And that's all the passages in the New Testament that talk about music and worship. And they all say, sing, speak, teach, admonish, lips, words that are describing vocal music. Now, if we can understand that roast lamb, even though God didn't say not to use it, we shouldn't use it because it's different from what he said, the same thing is true here. God didn't have to say, don't use instruments of music. He told us what kind of music he did want us to use, and it's all singing and words that refer to singing. And the gospel warns us then not to do things different from what God said, just like we talked about with regard to roast lamb, the same thing here. Isaiah 55, we cannot know what God wants unless he tells us because we don't think like he does. Jeremiah 10, 23, Proverbs 14, 12, way that seems right to a man, the end of the way of death. Matthew 59, worship is vain based on human doctrine. Galatians 1, 9, we're cursed if we teach a different gospel. 2 John 9, we don't abide in the doctrine of Christ. We don't have God. And lots of other passages we could use. All of them make the point that when God tells us what to do, what is different from what he said is displeasing. He didn't have to say, don't use roast lamb, and he didn't have to say, I don't want instruments of music in worship. He tells us what he wants, and to do something different is an unauthorized human invention, which he's telling us not to do. Well, follow through now the other arguments that are used for the instrument, just like we used them for the roast lamb, the Old Testament. They say, well, instruments are used in the Old Testament. I hear this over and over again on my website. They even use the instrument, and we've seen it in the Wednesday night had no class in the study of the Psalms. Sure enough, David did use them. And there's lots of Old Testament passages that clearly say that they used them. But the thing is, we don't follow the Old Testament. For our authority and our worship today, we follow the New Testament. Surely there are some things in the Old that are in the New, but instrumental music, like Rose Lamb, is not one of them. They were in the Old, but they're not in the New. And so, Hebrews 10, 9, and 10, Jesus took away that covenant. So he could establish the second. Colossians 2, he brought out the handwriting of ordinances, nailed it to the cross. Galatians 3, we're no longer under the tutor, which is the law. In Galatians 5, that law is a whole, a complete law. You can't take part and leave part. You can no more please God if you take the roast lamp or the instrumental music. Either way, you're trying to take part and leave the rest. It won't work as a whole. And if you take part of it, You've fallen from grace. But now again, for me, and I hope you'll think about this, the very fact that instrumental music was so clearly authorized in the Old Testament, but it's nowhere in the New Testament, that helps me understand God does not want it today. If he wanted it today, why doesn't he clearly say so like he did in the Old? It's so conspicuous in the Old and also conspicuous that it's not in the new, just like the roast lamb and various other Old Testament practices, other animal sacrifices and Levitical priesthood and worship in the temple and the Seventh-day Sabbath. The fact that God wanted it, then allowed it, today doesn't mention it, shouldn't that convince us that he doesn't want it today? That's why it's not there. Well, I say it's an aid to worship we're told, and again, we hear that again and again, the instrument. Well, it will, it will help the singing. We'll have better singing if we do it. It's an aid to help us in our singing. But what we learn with regard to AIDS is an aid it simply helps. It doesn't add something different, different from what God said. It must just help what God authorized to do. And so with Noah and the ark, he said to build a goat for wood, but metal is different. The hammer and the saw might be it's legitimate aids, but he's still just doing what God said. He's making an ark. But metal is something different from what God said. Spring and pouring is different from burying. Now, a pool of water is a help 
to do the burying, but it's just an aid. But you sprinkle or pour the water, that's different from what God said. And if you baptize a baby, it's different. And the roast lamb is different from what God said. And we know it's wrong not because God specifically said not to, but because it's a different kind of food. It's not an aid, it's different. And the same thing is true with instrumental music. If you can understand that roast lamb is not just an aid to bread and fruit of the vine, you ought to be able to understand that instrumental music is not just an aid to singing. It's a different kind of music. And it's wrong for the same reason. Well, all about heaven. People say, well, there's instruments, there's mayhems, uh, uh, there's in heaven, they're using harps. And there are several passages that refer to them. But again, first of all, it's, uh, it's symbolic. Revelation is a book of symbols. The fact that there are symbolically people using lamps doesn't mean God wants us to literally do them today. And things practiced in heaven are not authorizing our worship. Again, should we because heaven, or Revelation mentions the Mount Zion and the creatures and the throne of God and the many waters and the sea of glass and the battle with the beast. All of those things are in the context of those references to harps. They're symbolic. Should we literally take those things that bring us into our worship? We understand that that's not the point. Just like God said, Jesus said that there's no giving or in marriage or marriage in heaven. It's different there. The rules are different. And again, to me, the contrast between what he says for our worship on earth and heaven helps me to see that he doesn't want those things, in particular the harps, here. Isn't it strange? It seems strange to me. When people want to justify instrumental music in worship, they go everywhere except New Testament passages about talk about our worship in the church. They go to the Old Testament to try to prove what we should do in the New Testament. They go to heaven to try to prove what we should do on earth. Why they don't, why don't they just go to a passage that talks about the New Testament using instrumental music and worship in the church? The answer is because there aren't any. That's why. And they know they're not there. That's why they're going to the Old and they're going to the, and other places except with regard to what the Bible says about our worship today. The difference should show us that he doesn't want it. That's why it's not there. And then finally, the using of our talents. Yes, people have talents to use and play instruments of music and organs and pianos, and it takes talent to do that. And there's legitimate uses for that, but not, that doesn't mean it's legitimate in the worship of God. Just like the chef cooking the roast lamb and the butcher with the animals and the animal trainer and all those other things. The fact people have talent doesn't authorize the use of it in worship to God. So, where are we, what is the point of the lesson? The lesson I hope you see is if you can understand, see, I don't have people knocking down my door trying to convince me to use roast lamb in the Lord's Supper, but I have all kinds of responses for people trying to justify instrumental music in worship. But it's the same thing. The principles are exactly the same. Every argument, every response is exactly the same. And so while people use these various kinds of reasoning to try to justify instrumental music, the fact is, overwhelmingly, why do they really use them? They did, they're not using in, instrumental music because they read about the harps in heaven and said, okay, let's have harps in the church. They didn't start using them because they thought this is an aid to our singing. The truth is people use it for basically mainly two reasons. Tradition. They grew up with it. They're accustomed to it. Family of tradition. And they can't bring themselves to believe it's not right. And secondly, they like it. It's entertaining. It's enjoyable. It's exciting. And so they don't want to have to get rid of it. The truth is, all these other points that we've made, though, show by the scriptures that it's not right. It's not what God says. And the fact that we like a thing, or even the tradition, Jesus in Matthew 59, when he said, in vain they worship me, was talking about human traditions. And the other passage that we've studied talked about, God doesn't like necessarily what we like. 
So the point is we have to do what God says in his word, not what men might think. So I want to conclude with Luke chapter 16 and verse 15 with me, please. Luke chapter 16 and verse 15. Luke chapter 16 and verse 15. Jesus said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The fact that people like a thing, traditionally practice it, enjoy it, defend it, that doesn't mean God is willing to accept it. We want to know what God accepts, we go to Scripture. We study what He says in His Word about what we should do in our worship to Him today. And it does not include instrumental music, just as surely as it does not include roast lamb on the Lord's table. So I hope you'll think about these points and consider them in your service to God. God has authorized what he wants us to do in service to him. He's pleased when we do that. He's not pleased when we don't do that. Have you made the commitment to give your life in service to God? If so, you must do it what he, the way he says. Believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess him and be baptized, immersed in water for the remission of your sins. If you haven't done that, why not do it tonight? Or you've done it and fallen away and need our prayers. Won't you come and make a note as we stand and while we sing? Who at the door is standing?